Happy Friday, everyone. And thank you, Justin and the conference committee for extended time. I am Dave Gamandi. I am the open publishing librarian at the University of Virginia, and I'm also managing editor of Aperio, which is the university's open access press. So I'm going to share a comparison of so-called transformative agreements with library publishing from an economic perspective. Every dollar that keeps going to the oligopoly is a dollar not going to your library publishing program. Every million that goes to them is a million robbed from our collective budgets, which makes our work harder. So I'm going to be generalizing a bit in regard to library publishing, referring to it mostly as a no APC form of journal publishing. I'm also going to be generalizing a bit with TAs, so-called transformative agreements, referring mostly to the ones with the publishing oligopoly. So I'm going to share three major points, and I'll be curious to hear responses. I want to acknowledge first the Black freedom fighters whose lives, legacies, and intellectual tradition have helped shape my analytical toolkit. They have been my greatest inspirations and teachers. But before I begin, I need to make a quick detour. Sometimes being part of this tradition that I'm referencing means being in someone's house and pointing out that the house is on fire doesn't mean I started the fire, though. I last spoke at LPF in 2019 in Vancouver as an invited speaker in the closing plenary. I criticized APCs and threw out the idea of problematizing so-called transformative agreements. With just a few minutes left in the entire conference, someone I believe to then be a sitting board member said that I needed to be more nuanced and that APCs can work. I didn't respond at that moment, mainly because there were only a few minutes left. I was also shocked that someone thought it was appropriate to tell a person of color to be nuanced. That's a form of tone policing, silencing, and in my particular case, an attempt to punch down. I oppose APCs on principle which means there is no gray area. I don't feel the need to play both sides and I don't need nuance when I have clarity, conviction. So people of color should skip nuance if it really means comforting white people and especially if it means jiving people. APCs are still trash and people are getting hip to the fact that TAs are not what they're cracked up to be. So my first takeaway is that transformative agreements, quote unquote, leave the means of production in place, which is often in the hands of the oligopoly. So I want to share a way of analyzing society that I've found eye-opening and is useful in a wide range of settings. It's often called the materialist analysis and it places heavy emphasis on the economic base in society. This economic base is made up of the means of production and the relationships they produce. The means of production are, for example, tools, equipment, raw materials, land, computers, buildings, whatever is used to create goods and services. And the relationships involved are commonly that of employer and employee. A class of relatively few people own the means of production, while the majority of us use them as we work for a wage, but have no ownership. This materialist analysis says that whoever owns and controls the means of production wields tremendous power over not only their employees, but broader society, influencing government, laws, school, culture, and the environment. And a lot of history, if we look closely, is a struggle over who owns the means of production and the resulting wealth that is produced. 
We live in a system where most of us need to work for a wage, which means we work using means of production we don't own to produce wealth that's kept in relatively few hands. And if that sounds unfair, it's because it is. That's why many of us wanna see the means of production democratized and owned and controlled by the people who actually work on them alongside with our communities. Well, if we apply this to TAs, we see nothing changes. Nothing is transformed. The means of production are left exactly where they were, often in the hands of the oligopoly. And because the knowledge producers, that is the authors, editors, and reviewers have no ownership nor control, the wealth they make still ends up in other people's hands. Also, when the elite and wannabe elite universities force their authors to hand over their labor to the oligopoly for free, the library loses any power it may have had as a consumer. It's really that simple. And that's why nature now has an $11,000 APC and cell has a $10,000 APC. It's why a TA can only knock off 10 to 15% from an APC sticker price. Libraries have no leverage because it was given up. So I wanna emphasize that the consumer has very little power when dealing with monopolies, which is why I say your values don't matter. If the university pushes authors to the oligopoly, and libraries are forced to shop among monopolies, then sustainability, accountability, transparency, DEI, and whatever else are considered academic values don't make a difference. Trying to bend cost curves, apply market pressure, have skin in the game, or using a multi-payer model don't change outcomes. And in fact, is rather deceiving. Let's think about Starbucks. Neither you nor the barista controls where the stores are, how long they're open, who works there, where they get the beans from, what products are made, or what the prices are. The people who own and control the means of production, Starbucks's shareholders and board of directors do. And if your employer forces you to patronize Starbucks, then do your values really matter? The same applies for authors who are pressured to publish with the oligopoly and libraries forced to pay for it. All right, let's, let's move on to library publishing. Library publishing is university owned and or controlled means of production, meaning it's owned by the employer. The university largely decides who has access to it, when, under what conditions, at what cost, and controls what they're allowed to do with it. This closes the distance to scholars and readers, but for the most part, the means of production are neither owned nor controlled directly by the knowledge producers. This is key. There's a difference between TAs and library publishing but perhaps not a fundamental change regarding means of production. More scholars have access to publishing and perhaps greater autonomy when engaging with library publishing. I don't imagine, for example, most of us would claim ownership over journal titles. And library publishing allows us practice, so to speak, in operating the means of production, but ultimately, they're owned and or controlled by the boards of trustees. And that's still a far away from freedom. So my major takeaway number two is that TAs are as empty as putting body cameras on cops. So in this section, I wanna talk about reform. There are your typical cheap illusionary reforms, and then there are more substantive rather non-reformist reforms. So your regular reforms 
serve the establishment. These reforms kind of fool around at the margins, but don't overturn anything significant. They keep the relationships of power the way they are. And reforms don't work on institutions that are racist, capitalist, and imperialist. And there's no better place to see this than with the police. Sensitivity training did not stop the deaths of Fred Hampton, Michael Brown, Rayshard Brooks, or Alton Sterling. Implicit bias training will not prevent another murder like that of 12-year-old Tamir Rice, Freddie Gray, Philando Castile, or Amadou Diallo. De-escalation training will not stop another death like that of Daniel Prude, who was naked and having a mental health crisis, or Marcus David Peters in Richmond, Virginia, who was also naked and having a mental health crisis or high school student, Anthony Thompson, Jr. Less than lethal weapons like tasers did not prevent the deaths of Dante Wright, Oscar Grant, or Micaiah Bryant. Community policing won't help the next Philip Pinnell, who was killed near my kindergarten, Sean Bell, Brianna Taylor, or a Tatiana Jefferson. Cameras will not stop police from killing George Floyd, Eric Garner, 13-year-old Adam Toledo, or Xavier Hill from right here in Charlottesville. And this is why abolition is such a powerful concept. 2020 was the year I learned to stop worrying and love abolition. Abolition means a system has to go in order for people to create something that actually serves the masses. Abolition of unjust systems is a way for black lives to truly matter. It doesn't throw good money after bad. And that's why a transformative agreement changes as much as body cameras on the police. It's an illusion of change of something better, but it makes the fundamental mistake of putting more money in an unjust system. And remember that the oligopoly are increasingly the cops too. Elsevier via LexisNexis and Thompson Reuters via Westlaw are working for ICE and helping to deport our neighbors. So a TA says a university values a company and has a mutually beneficial relationship with them. Sure, they may quibble on price, but they really serve each other. The university doesn't really dislike Elsevier. Transferring more money to Elsevier and Springer is like spending more money on cops and body cameras. It means you want to keep them around. The government pays police to protect rich and property. And the university pays for a TA to maintain or improve their higher ed rankings because a TA buys greater visibility, readership, citations, and prestige. The role of impact factors not only stays the same, but is now rewarded with a $10,000 APC. As I've written elsewhere, the open access and a transformative agreement is a form of false generosity, meaning it makes no attempt at reciprocity because it does nothing to help other people's content become open. It's a one-way street. Library publishing is closer to what's called a non-reformist reform. It spends money on new structures and funds a fair amount of no APCOA. Expanding publishing within the university like we do creates space that can be struggled within. It opens up the greater possibility for authors, editors, and reviewers to organize and enact changes. 
So my third point here is a little bit of a concluding point. And it's I'm claiming that the presence of both TAs and library publishing inside of the university is a contradiction. So to better understand the fate of library publishing, we need to look at university presses. The neoliberal university absolutely hates spending money on infrastructure it can't easily monetize. That's why campuses have nice dorms, but austerity for university-based publishing. And that's why university presses are not fully funded, expanded, and completely converted to open. University presses have been dealing with austerity for years, and many of our library publishing programs have only known austerity or deliberate underfunding. Well, why does library publishing exist? Our publishing services are an acknowledgement by the university that something is wrong with the status quo. However, despite our track record of providing no APC open access, we largely remain underfunded because the university follows the rules of neoliberalism. Library publishing is only funded to the level in which it will help the university brand. That explains its proliferation, but our lack of meaningful size or funding. Yeah, every time I come to a library publishing forum, I see some really nice stuff happening, but it feels like it's happening in the nooks and crannies, and I'm getting more comfortable in the margins. That's why I think that TAs are a wake up call. Paying high priced APCs in TAs in the face of library publishing's track record is a new and heightened contradiction because the university wants it both ways. However, we library publishers get pennies while the oligopoly gets dollars. For the university to live up to the values it claims to be about would mean to allocate differently, to fully fund library publishing alongside no APC OA. But that would mean spending a lot more money on its own infrastructure, and that contradicts neoliberal logic. The same logic that says to outsource, to privatize, believe in the market, Hence, the large sums of money going to the oligopoly, either through subscriptions or TAs. Paying five-figure APCs while no APC OA stares you right in the face is a contradiction that will need resolving. So I was really only able to scratch the surface of these topics today. I'm also going to be sharing the full text of this talk, which will have citations, book recommendations, and comments that I didn't have time to make. Today, we looked at the means of production. Some people toil on them, others own them. TAs mean that the means of production remain in place. Library publishing, on the other hand, develops uh, the means of production, or at least brings control of means of production inside the academy. However, in neither case are knowledge creators directly in control or ownership of them. My second point was about reforms and how they mostly serve the powerful, which is why I say that TAs are as meaningful as body cameras on the police, and that abolition is freedom. And the rise of TAs and the $11,000 APC alongside us, mostly no APC library publishers, is a new contradiction. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to questions and dialogue.